Good morning. It's Wednesday. It's 11 o'clock. It's September the 15th, 2021. Welcome to What Now America. I'm your host, Tim Apicella. And I would like to start off with a title of this one called Rig Election GOP's Mainstay Slogan. Remember 2016, this thing called the presidential election, Donald Trump. And well before the election with Hillary Clinton, he was uh, proclaiming that the election was already riddled with fraud and inconsistencies. And uh, I think he was doing that because he knew he was going to, in his mind, he was going to lose the election. So he started claiming foul months and months before the election day. And then a funny thing happened. He won. Well, it wasn't that funny, but he did win. And the bottom line is, he still clung to the fact that he'd been robbed because the popular vote was in favor of Hillary Clinton and not Donald Trump. So Donald Trump created what is called the Voter Fraud Commission. And that commission from May 2017 to January 2018 investigated Donald Trump's claims that uh, dead people rose from the grave and, wrote, and, and voted in favor of Hillary Clinton. All sorts of crazy, crazy conspiracy theories. Uh, the Secretary of State for Kansas, uh, Chris Kobach, uh, completed the report and said there was glaringly empty of any fraud. So that was pretty much the end of it. Then we go to 2020, the presidential election. And as we all recall, months before the election, Donald Trump was claiming that there's no way he could lose. And if he did, it was going to be riddled with fraud. And he was particularly taking issue with ballots. And then on July the 30th, 2020, he tweeted that um, the 2020 election will be the most inaccurate fraudulent election in history. And then a funny thing happened. He lost. Fast forward to uh, Monday of this week, where Larry Elder, a candidate trying to unseat uh, Governor Newsom of the California recall election, uh, had set up websites that uh, were pointing towards fraud and to report fraud. And then he himself said that the fraud had been detected. And this website was called Stop California Fraud. So what we're seeing a pattern here now is uh, the big lie, of course, but also we're seeing a pattern that every time there's an election, the GOP starts crying foul and, and fraud before the election's even held. And I think they believe it. Uh, to quote from uh, Seinfeld, an episode where uh, uh, Costanza is giving Jerry some advice, he goes, Remember, Jerry, if you believe it, it's not a lie. And I think that's exactly where the GOP is. So without further ado, let's dive head, head first into this topic. Uh, with me today is Jay Fidel, Winston Welch, and on assignment is Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Tim. Nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Hey, you know, Jay, um, we're starting to see a pattern now emerge. It's not just with Donald Trump and his acolytes supporting the big lie that the election was stolen from them. Uh, we're starting to see other candidates do that now in their elections. And Larry Elder comes to mind because that was the most recent. Will this pattern of claiming fraud serve the GOP in any way? Or is it a matter that they're just trying to uh, imitate Donald Trump to, to satisfy would-be voters? Well, the whole subject uh, wraps around so many issues. I am so glad you brought up the 26, 2016 campaign. Um, and I remember how shocked I was when a reporter asked him, are you going to accept the results of this election? And he said, only if I win, only if I win. So let me get this right now. There's gonna be fraud if the other guy wins, but not if you win. I mean, and, and that is so obnoxious. Only, he, did the only, same, he did the same thing in 2020. Yes, he said, he there's did. no way I could, I could lose. And if I do, it's fraudulent. Right. But if I win, it's not fraudulent. And then we've had all these commissions and they found no fraud. So what you get is a guy, and this is out of his real estate practice in Queens. This is, this is out of the sharp dealings that he's had all his life. You always keep your options open. You never agree with anything. It's never a win-win, it's always a win-lose, and you must win. Um, it's, it's a business approach, uh, but in the lowest possible form of business you could imagine. That's where he gets it from. But it, but it has an, an extraordinarily damaging effect on our society, on our democracy. 
to not accept the results of an election when you have no reason whatsoever um, to question those results. Uh, it's really horrible. You know, what, what could be more important than the peaceful trans, transfer of power? What could be more important than voting? What could, you know, free and fair voting? What could be more important than accepting the results of a vote? This guy is, 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 a, is a destroyer. And what is, to answer your question more fully, what, what has happened is he's, he's created this, this virus of lies, a pandemic of lies. And this is one of them. And he's got, he's got the whole Republican Party, or at least the, the new Republican Party, the recreated, the Republican Party created in his image, uh, all of whom are his acolytes and follow his pathology. He's got them all accepting this lie that they never lose elections. They always win elections. And if they lose, they come up with these phony baloney fraud stories. And, and what's interesting is uh, people were speculating a few months ago when he first raised the big lie, you know, is this going to pervade um, the Republican Party? Are they going to raise this again and again? Are we going to see the Republican Party try this, 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 <clears throat> this, this ridiculous um, strategy in future elections? And, and nobody knew. I, I don't think it, it happened, really. Um, although maybe there was some noise about that in the, the Georgia senatorial race races back in January. But, you know, I don't think I don't think it was really that much of a threat. It was a it was a possibility, but not a threat. Now we have Elder. And um, he's a Republican. He's a Trumper. He's going to do everything that Trump has done. He's going to accept Trump's strategies, you know, lock, stock and barrel. And he trots this out. And, um, you know, when he did, my reaction, I'm biased about this, but my reaction was, is he kidding? Is anybody going to believe this? It is so obviously a copycat maneuver. Um, no, nobody would believe this. You know, to say that if I win, there's no fraud, but if you win, it's all fraud. And say it in advance like that. Well, in California is a fairly educated, fairly progressive state. And I think people saw that for what it was. Even Republicans saw that for what it was. And he did not make traction with that argument. I think he lost points, certainly with the Democrats in California and with a, probably a lot of Republicans, too. So my answer to your question is, no, it didn't help him that much. It probably hurt him um, because it's obviously irrational and mm, unacceptable. It's um, part of the big lie. Um, but the question is not so much California. It's other states. It's other Republican parties. It's other mm, Republican candidates. So although I feel he didn't make traction in California, there are others who will try it again, and they may make traction. Okay, well, here's a follow-up to that, because you mentioned um, Georgia, I think. And Donald Trump was not well liked for claiming a fraud of the Georgia election before it took place. In fact, they, they say that was uh, contributory to the fact that GOP voters just stayed in their uh, lazy boy chairs. They didn't get up and vote. They, you know, they, did, they were discouraged because they, they, they listened to Donald Trump and they thought it was fraudulent, so why bother? Uh, this may have happened to Larry Elder in California, but it's certainly a valid point that if you're gonna call something fraud, what's the use? Why get engaged? The whole system, quote unquote, is rigged. And so therefore I, I, I sit home and protest in silence. How is that gonna serve the GOP party? Well, it depends. I suppose it depends on which Republican you're talking to, which voter you're talking to. Some of them may have been discouraged by that and not and not gone to the polls, but others may have said, "Wow, we, we better do something. We better take them at face value. Uh, we want to, you know, beat the fraud. So we're going to go and vote." It's hard to say that there's, um, you know, um, there's a tilt either on one side of that question or another. Um, I, I rather think, though, that the Republican acolytes, to use your word, 
are, are going to accept what he has to say and they're going to get on board and they're going to vote to win. This is all a, a ball game in which you cheat and they're going to do everything they can to elect Republican candidates. So I think we'll see it again. And I think, you know, the Democrats may get discouraged and not vote, but the Republicans will vote. They'll see it as a, a ball game that you can cheat in and it will have an effect in some places, some candidates. All right. Thank you, Jay. Hey, Wins, I'm going to throw some numbers at you, so uh, hang on here. Uh, a poll by SSRS, uh, the CNN poll, uh, found some interesting numbers. And that is 78% um, of the GOP, 78% of the GOP feel that Biden did not win properly, that he is an illegitimate president of the United States. 54% uh, of that same GOP say there's solid evidence to prove it, yet there is none. And there hasn't been any, but they still cling to the fact that there's solid demonstrated evidence that Joe Biden is an illegitimate president. So that's some of the background. Uh, other numbers, 56% uh, uh, believe in the country believe that democracy is under attack, where 51% believe that in a future election, there will be an overturn of the results because one party didn't win. Uh, these are pretty shocking uh, statistics. Now, a poll is a poll is a poll, but um, your thoughts about these numbers and uh, what it seems to indicate about future elections and um, the pessimism that is demonstrated by this poll. Well, uh, it, we, we've taken it, we've taken it on the chin a little bit uh, in the, uh, the, the last few decades here, but you, you think back to Bush v. Gore in 2000, there was no clear answer um, uh, for a while. Uh, and people remained pretty calm when you think about that relatively. They, they thought, well, I want my fellow to get in, but if the other fellow gets in, uh, we, you know, we'll concede magnanimously. And they had their fleet of lawyers, of course. Uh, you remember the hanging chad and the fellow looking at the hanging chad. That seems so um, idyllic and calm and rather, um, you know, quaint by today's standards where, like Jay said, when you have presumptively said that any, any election where I don't win is fraudulent, uh, you're completely um, uh, dismissing the system. And that is where the real danger lies. It's, uh, it's not on the platform or what they are believing. Should we have higher taxes? Should we have more access to abortion or less? Should we um, uh, you know, legalize pot or, or you know, increase the debt? None of those things matter. It's all about uh, that, that there's the big lie that our, our elections are, are fraudulent. And when you have that presumption going into that by well, any, any percentage of the population that matters, you're really, you're really dealing with, uh, with some danger there. And that's where I think we need to focus is on election security. But we've seen We've seen we, we had the most secure elections that we ever had in 2020. But if you don't believe that that took place and you believe, in fact, that that was fraudulent because you're getting your news source from one or two news sources, that's a self-referring feedback loop, despite all evidence to the contrary. It really doesn't matter what the truth is. You it, 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 it's it's like Kellyanne Conway said, it's it's alternative uh truth or alternative facts or whatever nonsense she said, because that's where we're at. One thing that I, I saw yesterday, yesterday that I was um, particularly taken with, with when uh, Go Governor Newsom, it was clear that he had, uh, you know, defeated the recall for him. And, uh, and when he got up there, he really was speaking to all of Americans. And I think actually what I saw was a uh, preemptive uh, sort of stump speech for 2024 or beyond. Um, and he was feeling very presidential to me, honestly, where he was saying democracy is, he said, we can't have this, this nonsense where every election before we even have it is presumed to be faked by one side because it's, it's not. He said, democracy is not a football you can toss around like this. He said, it is like, an uh, antique vase or vase that that if it, you're, you're holding it and if it drops, it gets shattered and you can't put Humpty Dumpty together again like that. You can't put that vase together again. So we need to go back to the basic principles that our elections are 
are sound, that they are also fair, that they're secure. And when we we need to have, uh, since we're a two party system, we need to have the buy in of both parties of this because otherwise we will have a constant, uh, you know, battle of, of this idea, like you just mentioned in those polls, that these are always that whoever is in charge is an illegitimate leader. I don't think that 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 the uh, liberals or Democrats felt that Trump was unfairly uh, elected. Were they destroyed and and crestfallen and and uh, horrified? Yes, but did they accept it that it was a real election? Yes, they did, and Hillary Clinton did too. And she didn't go in saying, "Oh well, if if if." If I don't win, then it's fake. But the opposite is not true. Uh, so we we have to really work on uh, fundamental civics training and education for our adult population as well as the kids coming up. You have to add a point to that that I, I think we have to have in the, in the conversation here is that um, you know we we believe that Trump, if you look at it as to the vote and the electoral college and all that legitimately won in 2016. I don't actually, just between us, us boys, I don't really think he handled that in a fair manner. I think he brought Vladimir Putin in. I think he did all kinds of unfair stuff, which was never really raised. And people, as you say, Winston, they accepted the result. But Trump was gaming the system all the way through. He was gaming the system as much as he could. And, the, you know, he claims to have received all these votes, including a majority of the popular vote. I think he was manipulating that in every way he could. Hey, Jay, um, they had a, a Department of Justice investigation over the involvement of Vladimir Putin in, in 2016. And, um, you know, a lot of those results were pushed to the side because they were looking at other issues for impeachment. But remember, M Mueller basically brushed aside all, all credible evidence pointing to what you just said. And it was basically um, shoved aside and then, you know, a, a post-mortem uh, autopsy was reported. And, and yes, Russia had been involved in the distraction um, and in the influence on social media for Donald Trump. So uh, you, you're absolutely correct. It did. It did occur. Absolutely. So, uh, Winston, I just have one comment. You know, you mentioned, um, rightly so, the, the election of 20, um, the, the year 2000. And what kept a lid on it, I think, was Al Gore graciously accepted loss. And I think that's, that's the key. That's the crux that the standard bearer of the party who's running for office acknowledges that it's a win-loss situation. Um, there's no do-overs unless there is fraud. And um, he was willing to accept that loss. And I think that lowered the temperature nationwide quite a bit. But even days following, there were a lot of angry Democrats. I, I recall it very distinctly. But had it not been for Al Gore to say, I accept this defeat and we'll move on. Um, he gave a reason, moment. too. He said he accepted it. Uh, in order to preserve national stability. Correct. The, the very policy point we're discussing today, he, he did it for the country. He did it for and, the country. Yeah. Which leads me to my question to you, Jay, is will this strategy serve the GOP in 2022? Uh, if this continues, will, will this work or will it drive away GOP voters? And will it shove the independence um, away from GOP ideals and policies? I wish I could say yes, but I really don't think so. Um, and maybe somebody will be more optimistic than I am about this. But um, I, I feel that um, the, the notion of truth, the notion of democracy, the notion of fair voting it has been lost in this country. And there, uh, there's an enormous number of people who don't care about these things anymore. They only care about winning and supporting their cult leader, Donald Trump, or other cult leaders, if, if any appear. Um, and we, we've lost touch with the idea of um, diversity. We've lost touch with morality, if you will, and democracy in general. Um, I don't think this is going to change their minds. They're probably going to do it again. 
and other things. They are also doing other things like uh, stopping voting rights legislation and doing state voting rights uh, legislation that is ridiculous um, and taking all these draconian steps against fairness, against voting, against minorities. Um, wh why would this, why would what happened here affect them? I think they'll, they'll do it again and worse. I think they've learned by their own success. In fact, I would add one other point is Elders tried it, didn't he? And he had some traction with some voters. After all, he, he did get some voters. I, I don't know how much that was dependent on his, his uh, remarkable statement over uh, election fraud. But <clears throat> I, I think, in fact, he warmed up the issue for later, and it will come back. I think our voting system, our democracy is broken. And I would really like to be in a brain session with you guys at some point to figure out what, if anything, can be done. Because right now, despite this, um, you know, light at the end of the tunnel voting rights bill that was suggested yesterday, a compromise with the progressives in the House, I, I really, I don't think any voting rights bill is going to pass. And therefore, we're going to be stuck with the, the bills in these uh, Republican states that are dedicated to trying to stop people from voting. Together with all the other tricks the Republicans are playing, I, I would not be optimistic about a fair vote next time. OK, Jay, you took the question right out of my mouth because that's what I wanted to ask Winston. And that is this new bill introduced in the Senate that has Jan Joe Manchin's signature on it, or his, you know, his, his footprints are on it. Uh, he was part of the nine senators that got together over the summer and to say, how can we work out a voting right bill that everyone can live with? And it's now up to Joe Manchin to get 10 Republicans to get on board with the bill. And of course, yesterday, um, Senator Mitch McConnell said there won't be one GOP voting for it. Um, is this a setup? Is this the laying the, the groundwork for Joe Manchin to agree to modify um, the filibuster? Well, we'll see, won't we? Uh, this is this is what we've been waiting for. Is when he had his time to get his coalition of the the ten or the twenty willing and say we need to have bipartisan legislation to push this through. And, and once that he found out that that wasn't there because their top priority is just not having a Democrat in the White House. Uh, and he could see that rather than uh, just for what it is, then this is his time to, to move forward and say, this is more important than having a bipartisan <clears throat> ship because there won't be any, there won't be anything left if we don't do this. I can understand why he has some reticence in that, but we're also at a point now where if we don't do something that ensures that people do have the ability to have free and fair and valid elections, uh, you know, where people are going to be so disenfranchised, not that they already aren't, but let's face it, there's a demographic time bomb going off in this country. You can only suppress this for so long. And people are sick of it. They don't want another four years of what we just suffered through. They they see the result of that. And if they don't, well, you know, just take a look around. Say, are you better? Are you happier uh, than you were four years ago? Are your relationships better with your family and your friends? And I think uh, most people could say, well, I don't talk to this person or that person anymore. And, uh, you know, we can't, we just, uh, we got divided. But one thing that I thought Governor Newsom did yesterday was he said, Look, all this division, so much of it is just fake. That's the real fake news here. He said that, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but that he said, we have so much more in common, so much more in common than we don't. And that is the message that he needs to hammer home, that every governor needs to hammer home, that every uh, politician that wants to bring, uh, you know, that, that who, who was it that asked? Do you hate the other party more? Uh, do you hate America more than you hate the other party or something to that effect? Like, what's the end goal here is, is you know, our, at the end of the day, we're Americans and we need to support the best ideas coming forward in a fair and reasonable manner. And when you look at how our elections are, are carried out, uh, you know, with the manipulation of Facebook and that whole 
um, you know, psychodrama that they pulled. And was it was it with the Russians? Probably. But Facebook didn't need uh, much help in that with the Cambridge Analytica. They were doing that on their own. And and the vast sums of money that are poured into politics from special interests. It's hard for the average Joe not to feel a little bit manipulated or more. But I think Governor Newsom was right. Um, and I felt that also strangely in it, this was the 20th anniversary of 911 this year. And I just felt like there was something different about, uh, you know, and we, 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 we commemorate these these anniversaries for Pearl Harbor and, and significant events um, in this nation and, and rightly so. But 911, if you think about it, I think it wasn't George Bush's approval rating 92 percent or something right after those attacks. This is when Americans felt American. They felt united. They felt together. They felt our basic sense of values and and our our our, our nation were were attacked, which they were. And we came together in in that moment and realized this is more important. What we have here is precious and unique and worth worth. That was saving. twenty years ago, Winston. It was Everything has changed. Ago. And that's why it was so poignant this time to look back now and say, wow, we really took some wrong turns here in the last 20 years so that we're so divided now that we look back at that time with the sense of nostalgia and uh, almost a longing uh, for the, well, definitely for that, that unity that was there. It might, it might have been false and it might have been. No, I, I agree with you, Winston. Was, we yeah. took a reflective moment in time on this 20th anniversary than I recall years prior. Uh, prior. Um, America did kind of look at it and look inward and say, how did we get here in the last 20 years? And, you know, it's, and I will say that a lot of the news agencies did a great job um, highlighting some of these points. And more important is, how do we get back to something where we're not, well, of course, we're, this is not a nation where we have, you know, purist I, I, I ideas where we're all lockstep. We're not North Korea. Uh, we're not the Soviet Union. We're a land of diversity and diverse ideas where the best ones should come to the top. And uh, and that's what that's what we're about is, 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 is a competition for the best ideas. But we have to have a level playing field for that to happen, whether yeah. it's in business or in politics or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. This is that's one of the great things about America. So I am bully on America now, uh, especially after the 911 reflection of 20 years. I just felt like, wow, that was a, actually a really powerful um, look back and to say, and that's probably fed into Governor Newsom's win, is because we looked back and said, we don't need every single election to be recalled and counted and, and, and doubted. And, and, and this is nonsense. This is fake. And he called out Donald Trump specifically on this and said, he didn't say stop it, but he was just saying, this is where this is coming from. And we need to stop it collectively. Mm -hmm. I, I, agree, I agree with you, Winston. I, I, yeah. I think uh, he is a good candidate for president. Uh, he really presented well. He's got vitality. He's got it together. Um, and, and I agree with you also on this very important point that the celebration of 9-11 uh, actually created a, a, at least a, an echo of togetherness for a lot of people. And they felt they, very patriotic watching the media, as you say, Tim, watching the media over a, a week period or so. Um, on the other, well, hand, it was it was that in combination with Jake Tapper's um, special uh, documentary about Afghanistan, the twenty years, uh, interviewing every general that was involved in that war and their candid um, opinions about how things went wrong. So between the nine eleven remembrance and this Afghanistan look back, um, I think a lot of people said, "Wow, how did we get here?" But the question remains is whether that's going to stick around. It didn't stick around after 9-11. And my, my thought is it's not going to, it was a, it was a great nostalgic experience, a, a, a retrospective on togetherness for a while, but not for a long time, sorry. Um, and, you know, we can have these aspirational thoughts about how we have to come back together again. You know, that's nostalgia too. Bottom line is, um, you know, the vote. Bottom line is, um, you know, what happens on the 18th coming up this Saturday in Washington? Bottom line is what happens to all the 70 million acolytes that Trump has uh, somehow gathered? Um, not clear to me they're going away. Not clear to me they are of the same mind. 
not clear to me that Congress, uh, especially in view of McConnell's statement there the other day, uh, Congress is, is ever going to pass a Voting Rights Act. So we can be aspirational, we can be idealistic, but wow, <clears throat> um, there's got to be some measures taken, I don't know what, uh, in order to reverse a trend that is totally destructive. Uh, Trump set these things in motion. Uh, he, lay, he, he found vulnerabilities in the country. He exacerbated them. Um, he laid in booby traps. We've seen that in the news recently, too, haven't we? Booby traps that would blow up after he left office, many of them. Um, and, and now what's, what's left? Are we going to be able to survive? All right. Well, Thank Dave. you, Jay. Hey, um, Winston, we're out of time, but I want to get last word from you. And also, unfortunately, we didn't have time to uh, cover some of the news events regarding um, Bob Woodward's and Jim Acosta's book, Peril. Uh, some fascinating, scary things that have come out of that. And maybe we have uh, time soon to discuss a, a dedicated show just for those uh, revelations coming out of that book. Anyway, you have the last word, Winston. Absolutely. So, folks, if you're watching, Read the excerpts about this book uh, where you have the uh, top general in the United States basically saying uh, that uh, he was certain that Trump had gone into a serious mental decline in the aftermath of the election, where you have the Joint Chiefs of Staff issuing a statement that the U.S. military will not be um, adjudicating the election. This was a, a, a bizarre and sad time in American history. No one's saying that about about uh, uh, our current president, Biden. He may have stumbled uh, on, on Afghanistan, but how do you ex extricate yourself from that situation? Yeah. I, 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 I never thought I would. Very, we got we to talk about that one next week. But what I want to say, Jay, is uh, also, where's the, uh, where's the aspirations? We have to have lost, lofty aspirations. Where there is no vision, the people perish, and we have to... We have to build our castles in, the, we have to put our castles in the sky and build our foundations under. All right. Hey, you know, Winston, I knew we could count on you in the end. So good. Thank you. <laughs> Love that. CJ, there is optimism. Nice work, Winston. <laughs> nice work, Winston. <laughs> All right. We've run out of time. And I'd like to thank Jay Fidel, Winston Welch. Thank you for joining us on What Now America. Please join us next week at 11 o'clock Wednesday. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and I hope to see you again. Aloha.